Hi, this is Ari Kopel, your host of Shattering the Matrix. I'm going solo today. Wanted to talk to you all about ETs. Um, we're going to be starting a series uh, of um, talks with um, Eve Lorgan and others uh, in reference to my lab and super soldiers and um, negative ETs. And I wanted to discuss uh, my personal experiences uh, with respect to ETs and to give, I guess, the other side of the coin. So um, when I was very young, uh, I think most of you might know the story, kind of, but, uh, you know, I was... uh, what I would consider born awake. Uh, I pretty much knew that I was not part of this uh, earthly plane, shall we say. Uh, I came in knowing that um, my home was elsewhere. So I was very, very uh, in tune to that and um, had this immense longing uh, for being back home, wherever that was. But I knew that it was not on the planet. So since I was very young, I would look up into the stars and uh, wonder why I was here, uh, wonder where my uh, family was, but I was always looking up in the sky. I knew that the family that I was with, my earthly mother and father and uh, my young brother were uh, my family here, but they were not my true family. And so I was always seeking, seeking, trying to find um, a way back to, to my home, to my family. Um, and then as a very young child, I would always uh, draw pictures, uh, and I'm talking about as soon as I knew how to hold a pencil, um, probably in kindergarten, I uh, would draw uh, pictures of uh, craft, of uh, spacecraft, with beings and landscapes that were not earthly. I would, on top of that, create several different spheres that were could be considered moons, maybe um, different suns. I don't know, but it was almost like I was uh, capturing in my mind what I remembered. So I was always looking up in the sky uh, as a very, very young child. My brother, being two years younger than I was, uh, was always making fun of me because every time I would see uh, a light... Uh, something that was not indicative of being a star, I would go nuts. I would actually, you know, jump up. I would wave my hands and I would say, here, here, come and get me. You know, here I am, here I am. And my brother would, of course, have a great time with that. Um, You know, saying, calling me all kinds of names, that I was crazy and all that. So that went on for many, many, many years. Um, And then, of course, growing up, it was very, very strange for me because I, I I just didn't feel like I belonged and that caused a sense of being um, introverted uh, being very insecure um, as I mentioned in another show um, I wouldn't be able to speak with others I, I had a problem communicating with others uh, expressing myself I would stutter um, you know I would just be very very um, shy uh, amongst you know the human beings, I had no friends, uh, so it was a very very difficult childhood um, growing up. Uh, but when I entered uh, high school, I kind of uh, made myself go into things that would bring me a little bit, uh, at least make me more confident um, when dealing with people. So I took theater, which I happen to love acting and I I love movies Uh, so I went into theater and made myself get on stage which you know I I hated to be on the in the limelight however I I became so good at it that like I said uh, uh, in another interview um, I would I would shine I would excel to the point that people would give me uh, standing ovations and that type of thing but during that time frame around 17 years old, I was studying for a role that I was uh, doing the part of, and that was actually uh, Maggie the Cat in, in Cat in Hot Tin Roof with, uh, from Tennessee Williams. I was uh, studying for the part of Maggie, and they were playing it on TV that night, 
Uh, I remember it very clearly. It was right before uh, my parents got home from work, probably an hour before. They were playing it on TV, and I was looking at it just to see how Elizabeth Taylor played the part. And my brother um, came rushing out of uh, wherever he was, wherever I thought he was. I didn't know where he was at the time, but he came, and he started... Uh, interrupting my show and saying, hey, you know, you've got to come over here and take a look at this, like now. And I would shoo him away and say, shush up, you know, just be quiet, be quiet, just get away, I'm watching the show. So he'd leave, and a little bit later he would come back and try to catch my attention again. And, no, no, you don't understand, you really, really have got to come see this. And I would tell him to be quiet because I couldn't hear the lines, he just kept talking over the show. So come on, get away, you know, I would tell him, you know, just shush up or I'm going to tell my dad, you know, dad and mom. And um, so he would leave and then he'd come back and he did this like uh, maybe four or five times. And to the fifth time I said, you know, I can't see the show. I have to memorize these lines. and I've got to know how she does it so I can be really good at what I'm doing. And he goes, no, no, this is like really important. You've got to see this. And I said, okay, but if I get off this chair, it better be good. He goes, oh, yeah, it's really good. You've, You've got to see this. So he led me to my parents' bedroom, which was at the very uh, end of the house, the, the back part of the house. So we climbed the top of, the, uh, of their bed. Now their bed, their headboard, um, was uh, directly underneath uh, this window. Um, and so we both knelt you know, on, the, on top of the bed, and we were looking outside the window. And I go, okay, what am I looking at? And he goes, just watch. So... Okay, so I looked, and okay, so I'm going to go back for a second, and because I'll tell you what I saw. Before I, uh, before this point, I was, I had read I don't know over a hundred books I would say on UFOs. Um, I was a, a teenage expert, should you say, on UFOs, and I knew a lot of what to look for. Um, and I was so into this uh, that, well, my whole room was decorated with, with star systems and planets and, I mean, everything. I knew all the distances from all the planets. I knew everything, okay? I mean, I was a nerd. Uh, so um, on top of that, I became a young field trainee for MUFON at that age. I even had my little trainee card, my packet, you know, my instructions, everything of, of what to do if I saw a UFO. So I knew what I was looking at when I was looking at that window. First, I didn't know what, I, what he was calling me for, but all of a sudden, what caught my attention was lightning in one specific spot. And it just, it, it would, it would, irradi- you know, it, it would ra- radiate this lightning in one spot, and it was a cold-looking light, like a luminescence, like a fluorescent type of light, in the same spot over and over. And it was... Um, Every, I would say probably every t- 10 seconds, it, it, it would flash again in the same spot. Now, lightning, as we know, doesn't hit the same spot twice. So it wasn't really lightning. So I already knew that in a lot of UFO cases, uh, this is what was seen. Um, so I was looking at this, and, and I'm going, oh, my God. And so when this thing would, would flash and it, it would... Um, you know, uh, it it would become luminescent. I would actually see the outline of what was a huge mothership. It was, it was enormous, and it was right uh, behind our home, in a very busy area of Coral Gables, Florida, and it was right in front of one of the busiest streets in Coral Gables, Florida. So it's right behind my home, and I'm looking at this, and I'm going. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! And then all of a sudden, uh, out of the back of the, uh, the back end of this huge mothership, uh, I would say about fifty uh, scout ships came out, <clears throat> and these things were flashing uh, red and green, uh, red and green, red and green. I, I mean, it, it, it was like being it was spewed out of the back of this mothership, and these things were flying everywhere. Okay, and. Um, so at that moment, I'm going, my jaw's dropping, and I go, oh, my God, this is for real, this is for real. And so my brother is like, you see, you see, you see, <laughs> you, know, he, you know, I told you, I told you. And, and I'm like, oh, my God, I've got to go and, to, my, to my room and grab uh, my telescope and my, at that moment, it was my movie camera, which was the Ectasound 
movie co- uh, camera by uh, by Kodak. And of course, this thing ran in that film. I think it was an eight millimeter film or something like that. And um, of course, I couldn't find it. But at the same time, I'm hearing my father come in from work, and he goes, "Hurry now!" Mind you, the three people in my home, other than myself, were skeptics. Okay. Every time I would talk about UFOs, they would, you know, be patronizing. Oh, yes, dear. Oh, yes, dear. You know, but now my father's coming in through the front door and he's yelling, oh, my God, you won't believe it. There's uh, a fleet of UFOs out there. And I'm going, oh, my God, this is for real. So I'm in my room trying to find my telescope, trying to find my ectosound movie camera. And at the same time, now I hear my mother come in. She goes, oh, my God, you won't believe it. There's, there's a there's a whole bunch of UFOs up there. So. My brother is going out with my father and my mother, and I'm still trying to find the stuff that I need to record this because, of course, as a good little trainee for MUFON, I'm supposed to record this stuff. So I'm looking for it. I finally find it. I fumble my way out, and I, and I fumble my way. I stumble my way out, and I'm fumbling with the stuff, and um, I go out through the front door, and my, my mother and my father and my brother are standing in the little lawn area uh, of that, uh, you know, of, of the house right adjacent to the main highway where all these cars <laughs> are bumper to bumper coming home from uh, work. It, it was rush hour uh, traffic. This whole thing is happening during rush hour traffic. So it's not only my parents are seeing this, but all of Miami are, are seeing this, uh, especially in the area of Coral Gables. Um, so I'm running uh, out as best as I could, uh, holding onto the camera, holding onto this big telescope, coming out the door, and I'm, I get into that patch of, uh, of lawn, and I look up, and these five huge uh, UFOs, uh, you can say that they're, they're shaped like footballs, uh, five of them, I would say a little bit, they're, they're about the level of maybe a five-story building, uh, they weren't very far off the ground, and these things are pulsating uh, with this red light. At this moment, they're not green, they're red. All the other ones are just flying around everywhere, like little pixie dust all over the place. But these five decided to stay stationary there so that I could see them. Um, and at that point, of course, I dropped everything to the floor. I dropped myself to the floor. I fell on my knees, and I started bawling. Uh, my My... My face was was buried into the grass, and I was bawling, and I was communicating with them, and it, it, it was a constant communication of a plea to please remove me from from this planet. I really did not want to be here. I was miserable. I was terribly, terribly miserable. I was depressed. I was lonely. Um, I felt like an outcast. I uh, didn't have any friends. My life uh, was based on, uh, you know, being home and studying and metaphysics and everything else because my parents were into metaphysics. And I just just didn't want to be here. And I just, it, it, the sorrow, the sorrow that I felt when I, I was, when I was, I was basically yelling uh, from the pit of my stomach to please take me home. And the communication then came back that they totally understood that, to to hold on, you know, to to have courage, to know that what I was to do was much bigger, that I have a very very important plan and mission to accomplish, that they were always with me, that they never never uh, had left me, and that um, you know, being who I was at the moment, that I didn't recognize who I was, but being who I was was very important to carry forth the mission. So when I received that, I received a calm. And I don't know if it was a calm of understanding, uh, of buying into what they were saying, if you want to call it buying into, uh, but accepting what they were saying, uh, or if, if it was more like they calmed me. Uh, it could have been a combination of both. Uh, but with that, once I felt that peace and that reassurance that they showed up because I had been seeking them for so long and that I needed that to confirm who I was, so that I knew that I wasn't just um, a kid who was a nerd, a kid who was uh, not loved by others, but that I was here for a reason and that I was loved by the true family, um, which puts you know a lump in my throat every single time. <clears throat> uh, so my true family showed up to to give me courage, to empower me, to uh, you know allow me to know that. I was here for the bigger picture, 
uh, and that they were never, never, uh, that was never abandoned. Um, I was always watched and protected. And uh, they they basically uh, took off from that moment. I mean, there were all five of them, uh, you know, uh, next to each other, and then all of a sudden they just shot up straight into the air, into space. Um, there were there were a couple of them that were still lingering around, and so yeah, I took my movie camera, which did not work, and but I was able to see them through my telescope, and they were um, transparent. They were plasma okay they were not regular uh, metallic ships or uh, physical ships of any sort they were actually plasma ships and actually there was a set of them that there was one that I was able to see uh, that was uh, very visible through my telescope and I was able to see another one go right through it and come through the other side so uh, totally unlike uh, the ships that you know manifest through our atmosphere that pe- a lot of people uh, encounter, and definitely not any military uh, that uh, you know ships that you know that the military has uh, nowadays. Um, so since that point on, uh, I was more cognizant of them. I knew now what to look for, um, and so my experiences with them have been uh, nonstop. Um, you know, they've been continuously showing up for me um, throughout my life. Uh, Then later on, when I got older, I got married and I had my children, um, I was coming home from, uh, I had my own business and I was coming home from that business. Um, I I was driving my children, um, you know, they were sitting, they were laying down asleep in the back seat. And I was going through a very uh, dark road, and all of a sudden I get a really eerie feeling. Um, my little hairs on my on my arms and the back of my neck were standing up, and next to me in this empty field, I could see um, these strobe lights or probe lights or whatever you want to call them. There were searchlights that would go on and search an area or a patch of the land, and then you know turn off and then they would uh they would you know shine on somewhere some another part of that piece of land and then they would turn off and i got i i looked through the window as best as i could and i i saw this this craft um now i i knew that i knew in my being that that was not one of of the ones that visited visited me before in other words they were not what i deemed family okay they were not what i deemed the the um what what I know now is ultra terrestrials, the ones that visited me, um, and uh, they, they were following me uh, for whatever reason, uh, which could be uh, one of those that maybe were planning on abduction or something like that. But I picked it up, I picked, I sensed it, and so I tried to uh, you know speed as quickly as I could towards my my home, which I lived in an apartment building at the time, and. Uh, when I got there, I, I I could very visibly see the craft. I was very very scared. I was not so much scared for myself. This is this is what was one of those times that um, I really didn't care to see a UFO. Um, I didn't want to see these UFOs. Um, I didn't mind the other ones, but this one I knew was not good, and I was fearful not just for myself. I was fearful for my children. Um, so I grabbed them as soon as I got home. I grabbed them out of the seat. Both of them, you know, I was carrying each uh, in one arm uh, as best I could when. Um, um, it, you know, got into the apartment, um, and what I ended up doing was I ended up calling the police, and they probably thought I was nuts, but I basically told them, "Hey, listen, there's a craft that is, um, there's a spacecraft that is that is following me, and um, I'm not crazy. Uh, I happen to know about these things. I am a field investigator with MUFON. Um, at least, you know, back then I was, uh, you know, what I called a trainee because I really never got." Uh, any further than that, but I said, you know, I've I've studied enough about what this looks like to know what, what I'm looking at, and they said, you know what, ma'am, you really need to call uh, the Air Force because there's really nothing we can do about it. But they really didn't make 
they didn't sound like I that, like they thought I was crazy. They told me this is who you need to talk to at at uh, and, um, uh, at Homestead Air Force Base. Give them a call and um, and 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 see what they say. So I went ahead and did did that. I talked to I don't know who in, in there, and I told explained everything I was going through. I would say this craft is above my home right now, above the apartment building right now, and and I told them the location at where I was at, <clears throat> and. At that point, um, you know, they didn't they didn't think I was crazy either. I, I explained the whole thing again. Listen, I know what I'm talking about. This is what, you know, I've studied this. I know exactly what the symptoms are. This is what they look like. This thing is right in front of my house. I was uh, uh, scared uh, for my children, and I really urged somebody to come out here. Uh, and so I put the kids in bed, and uh, at that time, my husband was coming home from work, and I explained to him uh, what, was, uh, what was happening uh, when he got home. And we both, and he was uh, an ex-military uh, guy from the Air Force, my my ex-husband. So he knew about planes and all, uh, you know, craft and stuff like that. So we stood in the balcony watching this thing not move. I mean, this this object that was glowing white. Uh, but he said, you know, um, all the craft, uh, the aircraft in the area, all the airplanes and everything, all the traffic is stopped. At Miami International Airport, including the area where I where we were living, there was a small airport also, and all traffic was halted. There was no more air traffic, and this thing was just there, no air traffic. And all of a sudden, he hears the the engines of of, of an airplane and one of those um, uh, recon planes or uh, uh, the ones with the radars. I don't know what they're called, um, but anyway, uh, this thing came uh, out of nowhere and it was rushing towards this. Spot okay, this, you know, rushing towards this uh, light, which was right there, parked on top of our building. And as this thing got closer to the point of almost touching it, this thing, the the, the object shot up straight into the air. Um, and the next day, <clears throat> when I went to work, um, I ex- told the story to one of my coworkers who uh, used to be in the police department, and he says, "Just, just a minute, I." I know somebody who happens to be in the radar department of uh, of Homestead Air Force Base. Uh, let me let me ask him if there was anything weird last night. And he did talk to him, and as a matter of fact, they did spot a UFO on on the radar. So, uh, but what I'm trying to get at is that this particular uh, object was not, you know, one of the good guys. Should I say um, it? it I, I sensed that it was, uh, we, you know, we were in immediate den- uh, danger. I, I didn't like that feeling. It was one of those rare times that I certainly did not want to uh, encounter any aliens or any UFOs. And it, it was almost like um, my being knew, you know, the difference. Uh, but, you know, throughout my the history of my life, uh, I've encountered many, um, in, you know, when I went to... Uh, uh, Colorado, uh, on my, you know, I, I took a cross uh, trip, a cross country trip on my truck, and you know, through Texas, uh, there was, you know, one that um, that shot right, right, you know, over or basically on top of the trees. It just shot up, uh, uh, you know, through through the trees and just continued forward. So, uh, I encountered uh, through a lot of my, um, uh, should I say, journeys, uh, cross country. Uh, going through different um, initiations and things like that, I encountered many, many different crafts uh, that were friendlies and then, of course, then the ones that I encountered as a child. Uh, but the ones that I encountered as a child have uh, always uh, been on top of any any building, any house that I've stayed at, any place where I that I'm at, or residing or visiting, uh, they're there continuously. They usually, you know, place three of them uh, over where I'm at as a means of protection. And what I've been told is that if at any given moment, uh, if I needed to be plucked out, I would be plucked out. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, let you all know that um, that there is a difference between. Uh, the beings that I am in contact with um, versus the beings that we are th- that we are addressing on the radio show, uh, because the beings that are being addressed on the radio show are not here for humanity's best interest. Uh, whereas the beings that I've been in contact with uh, as a child and still are 
uh, here to protect humanity's best interests, to um, allow for humanity's growth and um, for humanity's potential, especially through uh, what we might call as an ascension process slash uh, transformation. Um, they're they're of a very high dimensional uh, you know uh, frequencies. Uh, they're, they're high vibrational frequencies. They're they're not uh, necessarily physical beings, uh, and and the way that they they um, they man those crafts they actually navigate is is usually through intention, uh, through their will, um, and uh, the the craft is is alive. It's it's plasma. It, it does have consciousness. Uh, there's um you know many instances where um you know i've been taken on board uh these crafts uh that are uh they first of all they're magnificent uh, they are translucent when you're on there um and and you know you do see the, the full scope of the uh you know whether you're you know in a solar system or in, in you're you're in you know you're traveling you're going through uh the, the a galaxy for example you will actually see everything it, you're, it's totally transparent um and there's def- uh, several decks uh, with that. The beings are luminous, and uh, it- it's 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 just amazing. Um, and I've been on board, uh, where there's many, many, many of us on board, uh, where we're all uh, you know attending meetings, or we're uh, on a one-on-one basis uh, having a specific uh, conference with someone. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something very, very important. We do not come back with those memories. Um, we do not come back uh, with those memories uh, for very specific reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is that we do not want to uh, uh, come back here and be compromised. In other words, have the risk of having uh, these uh, archontic forces, uh, reptilian forces, uh, the forces that are that are dark to scan us, to get information from us that will in, uh, give them a heads up as to what the light forces are up to. That is a no-no. And anyone who uh, is bringing this information forth via blogs, uh, via radio shows, um, through channeling material, giving information as to what the light forces are up to is full of shit. Okay, it's full of shit. The light forces are not going to give any information, okay, about what they're up to, because doing that would mean the demise of the light forces, about the uh, the demise of the mission, all right, uh, uh, of the demise of humanity. We would have no no way of of winning should the dark forces get a hold of the information. So. Anyone who claims that they are working with these light forces or these uh, 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 light uh, beings that are uh, so-called ETs or the Federation of Light or whatever names they call them because there's so many of them. There's the Galactic Federation, the Federation of Light, there's the Ashtar Command, and there's different combinations of it. You, you can change, interchange all these names in there. Um, and I've heard some even even wilder names. I can't even remember them, but... They're all referring to the same group, I'm assuming. Um, if if a person's really affiliated with these groups, with, with these beings that I'm talking about, um, they would not, with a good consciousness, uh, divulge any information that is being, number one, we're being spied on all the time, uh, n- not only through our governments, but through all these dark forces that are constantly listening in, uh, you know, uh, s- s- scanning us, uh, you know, uh, coming in. We're probably, a lot of us have attachments uh, with these things. We, we you know, the, we've got uh, implants on us. I mean, we would, these, the, all the 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 strategies uh, would be, uh, you know, taken by the dark forces, by the enemy. So if they're if they're disclosing that they that this is what we're up to and this is what we're going to do and all the light forces and everything is honky dory and this is what's going to happen and the 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 mass arrests are going to happen next week and and you know the, the, they're not they're not being truthful 
Uh, and if they're doing it uh, out of innocence, they're being used by the dark forces because the light forces are not giving in that information. We come in completely wiped clean. We do not come into consciousness when we are, uh, have, have uh, recently arrived from one of those meetings with any type of recollection whatsoever. Whatever recollection we have is a knowing that we were there. We will remember uh, the details of the fact that we were there. But in terms of the conversations that go on and the information that is uh, dispersed and, dis- and talked about, that is not given to us. Whatever is given to us is because we need to know so that we can... Um, up, up our, you know, uh, you know, whatever our, our mission is, we can be on, on top of that mission or maybe go in a different route with that mission. So we, we're given information on an uh, as need to know basis. That is the only reason we're given information is, is that, um, you know, for either our edification or for uh, the um, uh, furthering, furthering the mission for, uh, f- you know, to, to the point where we, we become more effective. Um, So that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to say to you guys today is that uh, uh, I don't want anyone to think that because we are constantly um, uh, honing in on the uh, or bringing up the information of the negative ETs that, that, that there are no positive ETs. Uh, there are positive ETs. The positive ETs are not the issue. Uh, I don't want to be, uh, for anyone to think that because there are positive ETs, that our work is done, that there's nothing left to do, that um, all we need to do is, um, you know, get our vibrations high enough and then we're out of here. Um, that, that, that is not why we're here. Furthermore, the, the, the positive ETs um, are here basically to supervise. They're not here to interfere um, because, you know, we're, we're the ground crew, shall we say, for anyone who identifies uh, uh, being a part of, uh, you know, uh, affiliated with uh, these ultra-terrestrials that I'm referring to, the ones that visited me as a child. If you feel like you're, you're one of them as well, um, you know, we're here what we call the ground crew, and we, we are embodied for a reason. Uh, there is a reason that I, of course, I was miserable, and a reason why I was left here, <laughs> even though I pleaded, and I poured my heart out. <clears throat> they, they, they um, you, know, the, you know, I, uh, in my innocence, and in my desire to go back home, did not remember. Remember, I, I come in totally veiled. So I did not remember who I, I the, the reason I was here. I knew I didn't belong. I knew that my, my family was um, from elsewhere. Uh, I, I was, it was confirmed to me, obviously, when they showed up that, uh, indeed, I wasn't crazy. But that, the reason for their sh- showing up was not uh, for them to take me back. It was to reassure me that my mission was um, not complete, that it was a very, very important mission, and that they had my back. And I have so many stories of how they have had my back uh, from truly, truly dangerous situations that would have meant if, you know, I mean, my freedom, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, just things that I did um, as being young and foolish that, you know, I just didn't know better, uh, but they totally shielded me and protected me. They have cloaked me so many times with the, uh, with the uh, uh, cloak of invisibility. Uh, they have removed... Um, potential danger from me and I, I i'm actually seeing this happen you know in in my consciousness i'm not my consciousness that in in my waking mode it's not like i'm sleeping or meditating no this is happening as i'm talking to you right now and and i would see them inter inter uh intercede <clears throat> in getting a, a certain danger uh, out of my way i have been driving in my car and all of a sudden they they need to get me on board and i would i'd fall asleep on the at the wheel um, to the point where my my daughter's a witness to this, um, and she would be in the front seat with me, and all of a sudden, you know, um, I would wake up in the nick of time, my foot being placed on the brake right before I would hit another car in front of me, um, and that's when she would realize that I had fallen asleep on the wheel, and then I would I'd, I'd get out of my car and I and I'd look up in the sky, and sure enough, uh, there would be a spacecraft 
uh, right above me. Um, I was told by fellow, um, what we call commanders, because that's what we're known, and it's not uh, that that there's a hierarchy. It's a, a um, a name given as out of respect, um, I guess, if we want to call it that. Uh, but I've, I, have, I have spoken to fellow commanders that have told me that that has happened to them as well, and that what I needed to do was address them and ask them to please not do that while I'm, while I'm driving. But it's not the first time that they, you know, they did that. Prior to that, they had done it many times, and I just... Um, I didn't know what that was until I actually started looking up in the sky and I go, oh, there they are. They're right there. So I must have gone to a quick meeting. And, uh, of course, up there might have been maybe two hours or something. I came back down and back in my car it, in the nick of time to put the brake on. Um, you know, things like that. In Mount Shasta, um, I, I went... Um, because I had started uh, a, a job, a very important job, and they uh, called me to go to Mount Shasta uh, right when I was in the middle of training for this very important job, like a, like a, an employer, a very big employer had uh, you know hired me as a manager, and um, so they 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 asked me to go uh, in, in the way that they do, which is usually telepathic. Um, I went ahead and got the tickets and the whole thing and made it to Mount Shasta. And um, I was actually taken to um, a place where, uh, uh, what's his name, um, Ballard, uh, I can't remember his first name, but anyway, the, the man who actually encountered um, uh, St. Germain, uh, the first time when, when all the I Am books or the I Am Presence movement started. Um, but uh, it, I actually visit the, the little motel or hotel where um, this man stayed. Uh, his name is Godfrey Ray King now, is his ascendant name, but I uh, can't remember his first name for some reason. I have a, a little uh, memory lapse there. Ballard is his, uh, his last name. Um, but where all the... Uh, uh, St. Germain meetings uh, happened with him in that hotel. Um, you know, it was no, you know, it, the hotel has now become a museum. And when I looked at, you know, I went, of course, with my friend, a friend of mine, and, and we, we started taking pictures of the, the actual windows of the hotel room. And the hotel windows started turning the, the color of the violet flame. And here we are, my friend and I, like two little giddy little girls, like two little, you know, girls like really, you know, when the Beatles, you know, I remember back in the 60s where all the girls would come really giddy and really retarded, you know, when they would see the Beatles. That's what we were in the middle of this parking lot that was having a huge fair of antique cars and people were just, you know, lined up in the street and drinking beer and eating hot dogs. And, and we were like, oh, my God, oh, my God, it's the, look at that, the, the violet flame, it's the violet flame, you know, and we're taking pictures of the violet of flame and, and and the more we would look at it the more intense it got and to the point that this uh, the violet flame would come out of the window and shoot out of the of the windows um, so and this was captured on film and I do have a lot of those pictures um, in, on our website the 2012.com website so anybody who's interested in joining the site uh, you know it's free uh, th there's a lot of pictures there on that as well um, but during that time frame, you know, when when we left that night, we decided, well, say, well, what are we going to do? We were going to go camping right on top of Mount Shasta, and we decided not to. There were a lot of mosquitoes. So we decided just to ride around and, and take a look and see if we could find this huge um, ship, uh, UFO ship, that she had called the Star of Bethlehem because it, when you look at it, it, it really looked like a, a, a humongous star like you would see in the movie, you know, any Jesus movie with the Star of Bethlehem. This thing was humongous and it looked just like it. So we were looking around for it and we ended up parking on the side of the road, a very, very dark road when, where there was just no traffic and we found the ship. Uh, it was It was absolutely huge. Uh, huge. Um, I did have a movie camera on me. Uh, this time it was not a, an 8mm uh, film type of camera. It was one of those digital things, but uh, for some reason uh, it didn't capture a thing. It only captured my voice screaming like a little kid again. Um, <clears throat> but we were looking at it, and it was, it was flashing almost like Morse code. Uh, and next to it, uh, all around it, were these little ships just like what I saw when I was 17 years old. Um, and there was a bigger one that I kept saying to my friend, oh my God, look at that one, look at that one. And as I was, as I was pointing to that one, that one decided to start moving. 
and get it and start moving towards us and so it stopped becoming red and green and all of a sudden it became white and started lazily moving around because that's the way they move they move very kind of like lazily and nonchalant and it's not in a straight line they're just kind of you know they're navigating it with their consciousness and this thing just kept getting closer and closer and closer and I've kept and I'm screaming oh my god oh my god look at that oh my god and I'm and all of a sudden it's like I'm praying oh my god I hope it's one of the good guys you know uh it's for some reason you know the flashback came back when I was uh, with my children you know um with that situation with that UFO um but it kept getting closer and closer and closer and it kept getting lower and lower and lower and uh, I I climbed out of the car uh, and and just was looking at it, trying to film it, and it kept getting again lower and lower to the point that it was just uh, uh, above the trees. I would say if if it was a building again, maybe five stories. That's how low this thing was, and then it slowed down, and it went really slow, and it was almost like a salute. This thing was doing a flyby for both of us and it was acknowledging that we were there and acknowledging the mission that we were on took its time to go over the car okay and and I was screaming it was like oh my god oh my god and then it, it, I became silent and it was like a mutual appreciation a mutual respect a mutual um you know namaste type of moment um they and then they cleared the car and then they went slowly, 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 climbed up and, you know, uh, started uh, getting altitude and just went all the way up and then became a star again. It pretended to be a star. It was absolutely magnificent, a magical moment. Um, but these are the things that they've done to remind me uh, because many times yes I've I had that wonderful experience when I was 17 I've had many wonderful experiences with them throughout my life when I've seen them and they've been in the most crucial moments of my life but I forget I mean I totally forget I think I'm alone that I'm alone with this uh, that I start believing the the reality that I'm living that, that that's uh, the illusion that's created uh, by the dark forces putting this ma matrix construct together um, you know making us really buy into it that we're really part of this nonsense that we're you know we have limitations that we we have illnesses that our bodies you know don't work, function the way they're supposed to that our finances don't work the way that, that you know we can't manifest things in, into our lives that our love lives are are you know falling apart um, you know that we have family issues and I mean all the things that that are not what we know in our home worlds and they're there to every so often They'll come into my life in a moment of amazing, you know, like I'm just in the dumps and they'll show up and remind me again who I am and who's who has my back. And um, so the latest communication has been that, uh, you know, I mean, I'm always asking, so uh, when am I out of here? <laughs> just want to know hey when is my time up you know when when is my you know wh when did I say that I'm you know I was agreeing to stay I mean what what was that deadline and um, you know they've reassured me because there was one point that I was like things were just happening in my life and and and, and all the headlines uh, around the planet you know it's just one thing after another and it just brings me to such sorrow uh, that I just want out I want out by whichever way I can. Um, I, I don't know what that looks like, you know, wanting out, but it means maybe getting on top of, uh, you know, maybe Yellowstone when it blows. I don't know. Uh, you know, getting picked up by, you know, a ship or something. Like, all of us think that that's our out. But the point is that we're really not out. I mean, we're here to work. We're here to do, um, you know, our, 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 our mission, to make a difference. Um, because if we're not here... Um, we shouldn't have come to begin with. We might as well have stayed where we were originally. Uh, very difficult mission. They're totally aware. Um, believe me, we are the Navy SEALs. If, if there's such a thing in, in those uh, realms, we are the, the Navy SEALs. All right. Not everybody uh, made it here. Not everybody was chosen to be here uh, to do this kind of work. Uh, very difficult work and uh, we are you know very shielded believe it or not 
uh, amidst all these um, dark forces and reptilians and uh, grays and all the, 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 you know, the infestation that is happening uh, in, in, a, in, in, this, in the surface and below the surface of this planet, there are amazing beings working on behalf of humanity right now. So I just wanted to make sure that all of us <clears throat> stay, stay um, focused on that as well. Yes, I know that we need to uh, acknowledge the fact that there are those dark forces working against us because we cannot let our guard down for one instance, not for one moment, not for one second. We cannot blink an eye with having, without having you know, a, another eye, including the third eye, wide awake, you know, wide open. Um, because they're very, very clever, very uh, stealth, and they're doing everything to dupe humanity. And it's very few of us who are actually awake to uh, to see the truth and uh, courageous enough to want to look at that ugly stuff that they the, these creatures and forces are doing, um, totally against uh, the divine plan uh, of our prime creator. And so the, the ones that I work with, the ultra-terrestrial beings of light, work with Prime Creator. Uh, they do work with all the true ascended masters, with all the true archangels, with all the true angels and all the hierarchy of light. These are the ones that um, are here as the guarding forces, as the gar guardian angels, shall we say. They're not truly angels, but these are the forces that are really uh, keeping this whole thing in check, because if they're not here, this planet would have taken, uh, would have been taken over already. Just so you know. Um, anyway, uh, this is, I think, pretty much uh, what I have today. Um, just don't give, don't give up. Um, there is what we call hope, um, you know, in, in the horizon, uh, these beings are very real. Um, there's many, many that I know personally that do have encounters, uh, personal relationships with these beings of light. And, um, it's not just me talking because I wanted to, uh, you know, speak because remember, I just don't really care too much for that. But um, for some reason, I was uh, given this task to do, and they know uh, that I am being used as a, a, a vessel to, um, to, to affect change in whichever way that I can, uh, whether it's, you know, a blog or website or speaking on a radio show, if I have to uh, get in front of an audience, if I have to create uh, videos, whatever that is, I am willing to do. They know, they know that of me. That is the, the, the person uh, that, has vol that volunteered to, to do this mission. That is the qualities that I carry. And uh, so... I'm bringing forth this information just so that you have perfect clarity um, and an understanding that as as dark as the information that we're presenting on these radio shows seem, um, as disturbing as it is, uh, there is uh, an equivalent or even superior, and equivalent in numbers, actually not, even superior in numbers of the light forces that are keeping this uh, in check, uh, that are uh, making sure that, that the light forces uh, have victory at the end. Um, but it is ultimately up to us. We do need to uh, step step into our roles and our missions, uh, be courageous, because it will get uglier before it gets better. Uh, you know, it, 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 these, these forces are, uh, they're not going to go down without a fight. Uh, they're not just going to throw that little white flag and say, I give up. They're not. Um, so the more of us that are awake, uh, 
the more of us that are courageous to look there and then spread that word uh, to all other light workers that are asleep right now, uh, believing all these new age uh, belief systems, uh, believing all the disinformation given by these uh, entities that are calling themselves Michael and and Mother, Father, God and uh, Sananda and, and St. Germain and Mary and whomever else you want to put in there that do not channel, by the way, the real ones do not. So if we can just bring this information forth to these people, uh, then th there are more light forces on, on the ground that can help turn this around. But if we are believing the propaganda given by the dark forces, uh, it's, the job and the task is so much harder, and it's just going to be longer. All right, We're going to be here longer, suffering longer. All right. We all need to be on the same page about this. And I, you know, uh, a lot of you have heard me say that many times. We're not on the same page. A lot of us have different philosophies, different viewpoints, different ideologies, and they're all based on that feel good feeling of whatever, whatever strikes your chord best, you know, whatever you resonate with. But the ultimate truth is that um, there are dark forces working against us that are separating us on purpose so that we're not in unison and so that we are, uh, by being divided, we're easily conquered. I ask you to please, um, you know, share uh, when you hear something, a show that has information that resonates with you uh, or a, an article or something like that that resonates with the truth and your being, your, 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 your true self, your sovereign self, which is in there somewhere, of course, in your soul, will recognize this as truth, then please share this with others so that they can also come to that same space, so that same place of the aha moment, and then that we can all join forces to finally bring victory to this planet. I thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Um, Again, this is Ari Kopel with Shattering the Matrix going solo to get uh, again today to bring you a little bit of, of hope uh, that despite the fact that uh, th there's uh, information that is not pleasant um, and kind of dark, or uh, actually very dark, uh, we are trying to shed light on it as best we can so that we're not duped and that we can uh, finally step into our power and divine authority uh, to take humanity back to to free humanity from uh, this this prison that we call the matrix thank you very much for joining we'll uh, join each other again next Thursday 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time good night You've been listening to Shattering the Matrix with your host, Ari Kopel. Please visit our website, 2012emergence.com. That's 2012emergence.com. Find us on Twitter at Matrix Shattered and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shattering the matrix. Listen to archived shows at blogtalkradio.com slash shattering the matrix. And join us next time for the birth of the new golden era on Shattering the Matrix.